uh, Sun Chinese for putting on a great event, and hopefully you get some good deals. So, as he said, I am Benny Ortiz. Um, I, I am a jig fisherman. So, what we're going to do today? Um, <laughs> Uh, so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk all things slow fishing. So I'm going to go through uh, the tackle, uh, kind of give you the whys behind everything that's here. I'll give you some anecdotal stuff, and then what I'll do is open it up to questions. Uh, we're going to talk about two different things still. We're going to talk about slow fish jigging. We're also going to talk about micro jigging, uh, which is something that recently I've gotten into and I'm having a lot of fun with it. So um, it's working out really great in the shallower water, uh, kind of expanding where I can use jigs. So. Um, Everybody here has heard of slow pitch jigging? Yes? All right, good. Because a while ago, uh, people would look at me like a deer in headlights. Um, they had no idea what we were going to come talk about, what we we're going to doing so, or going to be doing. So I started this about 10, 11 years ago in the US. Um, I was probably one of the first people to actually start it. Uh, and I just really stuck with it. Um, one of the really the things that appealed to me was that I just got tired of bait fishing. Um, you know, you learn how to put a bait down, you learn how to keep your uh, sinker on the, on the bottom, and Fish comes and eats it, and that's about that. There's only so far you can really go with that. And yes, it's very productive, but I, I wanted to kind of expand it to something else. And that something else for me was jigging. So I started originally back when Shimano had the uh, butterfly jigging system. You guys probably all remember that. That was out there. And, you know, you're just trying to rip that thing through the water column. And it's up South Florida in the summer, and it's not really conducive to your health. So I was like, there's got to be something else, right? So at the time, I started looking online started seeing that there's this thing in Japan and uh, it's called micro jigging, slow jigging, or slow pitch jigging. I was like, let me give that a whirl and see what's going on. So a very expensive game of trial and error. Uh, it took about two years to kind of get what they were doing over there uh, dialed for our fishery. Um, it, it was just, you know, buying things sight unseen, trying to get a $500, $600 rod from Japan to come over here. Um, buying jigs because you couldn't go to a local store and actually get jigs. Uh, one of the real big problems of getting jigs is, number one, you never saw them. Number two, you had no idea how to fish in the water. Uh, and number three, they were all very expensive. And the last but not least, you're shipping lead across the Pacific, and it is shipped by weight. So <laughs> that's a, it gets pretty expensive to ship jigs. So you guys right now have a significantly better start than, than where I was. So. Um, enjoy uh, places like this that actually have the stuff for you to do what you want to do. So, what is slow pitch jigging? Slow pitch jigging is basically uh, mimicking a wounded, dying, injured bait fish in the water. We're you're focusing on the fall of the jig. You know, sometimes I've heard people say um, you're, you're trying to create slack in your line. So, as opposed to speed jigging, where you know you get your your rod and you're just ripping that thing through the water column, slow pitch jigging, you're really using rod to impart an action on the jig by pitching up and letting the jig fall. So you can see there's a bunch of different jigs here that I have. I'll go through these in a bit, but you know, you got short and fat, you've got long and skinny, kind of everything in between. Then when you get down to the micro stuff, you got really tiny jigs like this. It's the 35 gram jig. Um, everything uh, for jigging usually is in grams. So uh, kind of a conversion from grams over to freedom units roughly I think it's 28, so roughly 30 grams per ounce. So um, that kind of gives you an idea. But after a while of playing with this stuff, you kind of start to feel um, what the, the actual uh, gram weights mean in terms of uh, water or using all the water. So back to uh, what we're doing. So mimicking that wounded or dying bait fish. As you can see, these are very specialized rods. These are really one-trick ponies. Okay? They're not really designed to do much else but to impart an action on the jig. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the butt end of the rod. I'm going to tell you the why this rod is set up the way it is and, and how it works. So first things first, we'll start at this butt section. Um, everything about slow pitch jigging is um, really focused. A little windy. Hang on a second. Good. So everything about slow pitch jigging is really what I like to call a listening game. Okay. Now, you're not actually listening to it like that, but you're really keying in onto what jig is doing in the water. So you're, you're using this rod as a tool, and having that exposed blank here is really part sensitivity. Okay, So you're going to be able to feel any strike. If a fish is sniffing this jig at the bottom, you'll be able to feel that sensitivity through the blank of the rod. Notice this little knob on the end. Now, when I go through this section at the end, when I talk about actually fighting a fish, you'll see why it's important. But 
usually when you pitch, you have the, the rod of your forearm here, right? So you're using this as kind of a fulcrum point to actually use the weight of the jig to load up the rod, then the recoil of the rod will pitch the jig in the water, all right? But this little butt section here is for when you actually do hook up, because when you hook up with a fish, it transfers to under your arm here, and you're fighting off of the reel as opposed to fighting off the rod. So there's no lift and pump with this, okay? These are very thin diameter blanks. You don't want to turn this into a two-piece rod by the lifting and pumping and high sticking, okay? Um, you can put a lot of heat on these things. They have a lot of really great tech features in them to make them very strong for their size, but this is not a, you know, eight-foot Calstar meat stick to, <laughs> to talk to a gentleman that fished with before. Um, you have to be fairly careful with this stuff. So when you have that rod under your armpit, Okay, you're fighting the fish. The reason why it's important is it doesn't let that rod slip out. Okay, so you're going to be pointing down basically at a 45 degree angle and just cranking on that fish. Okay, it's a very slow and even process. Moving up from the butt end of the rod, we have our reel seat here. A couple things. It doesn't look like a normal reel seat. There's really no foregrip on this. You don't need a foregrip because you're not lifting the pump, right? Also keeps the weight down on the rod, so it's, it increases the sensitivity that way and keeps it so you can fish this thing all day long. But we've noticed two things. First, it's a conventional reel seat. We'll talk about why conventional is important uh, in a little bit, but um, suffice it to say that just about every real you know, dedicated slow pitch angler that I know always fishes a conventional. The reason being is that you're going to have a lot more control over the descent of the jig, a lot more control during the fight. And a lot more better, a lot better contact with the bottom, so you're going to be able to feel when that jig hits the bottom and know exactly where you are. Um, it has a trigger grip on it, which is good because usually when you're fishing these, uh, you palm the reel from the side, so it's kind of you're a little bit off axis from what you probably normally do. But that trigger grip lets you get a really secure grip, and you can still manipulate the spool with both your index and your thumb. All right. Moving forward from that, uh, conventional guide trick. Okay, um, you're going to see a couple different types of guide trains on these rods. So the Shimano rods that I have this year is a game type slow J. This is kind of the peak of what they have here in the United States. Uh, this is really my go-to for just about everything offshore. Uh, this, this model, uh, they come in three different models. They come in a medium, a medium heavy, and a heavy. Uh, this here is a medium, which is what for your waters here, I would recommend in terms of weight, either that or um, in the Grappler series, like medium light, something like that. The medium is going to go up to about 330 grams in terms of max weight of your jig. Medium light is going to go up to about 260 grams. So you have a pretty wide leeway of, of jigs that you can use. I believe to use jigs on, on this setup down to, you know, 40 grams, 30 grams. I've used jigs on this setup from about 100 grams to a little bit over the state max of 330. I used up about 400. Um, but we'll talk about the, the differences in weights of jigs and how depths of water, things like that, in a little bit. Um, but back to the guide train, conventional guide train, you're going to see two different types of guide trains on these rods. You're going to see the standard conventional with just your, your uh, guides on top. You can also have, see ones that have a spiral, okay, so the spiral wrap on them. Um, I personally, I like the conventional guide train. Uh, the one thing that you have to be careful with is that, remember before I mentioned you're going to be creating that slack on your line? Well, if you're creating slack on the line and you're following that, that jig as it descends in the water, you got to make sure that you don't get tip wrapped. Okay, so that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, the spiral guides, they will, they will spiral usually to the opposite side of the handle. Um, and it does a couple of things, some beneficial purposes to it. Sorry about the wind guys. Um, you'll see that a uh, couple, couple beneficial purposes of that are if you're cranking on a big fish, the rod will twist a little bit. Um, so if you twist to one side uh, by cranking on the handle this way, having the spiral guides go to the opposite side of your handle will kind of even out your blank. Kind of the dirty secret, though, with that in the industry is that usually that's a byproduct of not having really good quality blanks. All right. Um, these blanks have what's called uh, high power X and spiral X. High power X is a cross of carbon that stops this rod from twisting. You can get it's almost impossible to get this thing off access to, to twist. So the higher end rods are gonna have is just a straight conventional guide train on um, which is really what I prefer. But you're also gonna notice that these are very small guides. They're micro guides essentially, almost like bass guides. So that requires you to have a very slim line-to-line -line connection. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit when we go over the reel. 
But suffice it to say that these are basically, again, sensitivity. Keeps the fly close to the plane. Everything's as sensitive as possible. Uh, the general features of these in terms of length, uh, you're usually looking at something between 6 foot to 6 foot 8-ish, 6 foot 10. Those are kind of your traditional slow pitch lengths. This one's a 6 foot 6, so it's right in the middle. Um, you have other models that are long fall models, which are uh, you know, almost 8 feet long. Those have separate applications. Uh, you can use those. Uh, usually on bigger head boats, you can keep the line away from the boat. Uh, sorry. Or, um, you know, some people just prefer having a, a longer rod. I like the, the shorter, more maneuverable rods. Uh, if you're fishing more mostly private boats, these are definitely more than adequate for that. Okay, so we talked about the, uh, the guide train, we talked about the rod, we talked about the features of the rod. Um, these rods are very parabolic, okay? Um, they will bend basically in a U shape, almost all the way to the real seat. Uh, the reason why is because you want to have that parabolic action to slowly and evenly unload the jig in the water. Uh, we talk about recoil a lot with these rods, uh, and recoil, uh, most people think it's, it's a fast snapback for a recoil, but really, these are very slow and deliberate, even recoils of the rod. So you don't want to have something that is too fast action. It's going to snap right back. And that's the importance of matching your jig to the rod. Okay, so you want to have, remember I said this one's rated up to 330. You want to be in that range up to about that because that's what this, this rod was designed to handle. It's going to give the right action on that jig. Um, when you hook up with one of these rods, again, a lot of high tech stuff in here, but you never want to go really higher than parallel with the horizon. Okay, so whenever I fight a fish, even if you know, even if it's a real big fish, the hardest thing in the beginning is to get away from that. Okay? Now you want to lift a pump. Right here, it's about as high as you want to go. That rod will be doubled over in the water, and it'll take a ton of heat that way. With a second to bring this up, it puts all the weight up onto this section here, which is no bueno. Okay? You do not want to have a heavy fish digging on just the tip of this rod. When you use the butt section under your arm here, you're putting all that pressure on this butt section, this will take a really big meeting, really. Um, but it relieves the, relieves the pressure on the, uh, the front end of the rods. So, you guys have a decent idea now of kind of the rod and the why behind the rod. So let's talk about the reels. Uh, conventional reels. Why is conventional reel important for slow pitch shooting? Well, I mentioned before that you're uh, you're going to be better contact with the bottom, right? But really, one of the main reasons is because you want to control the descent of the jig on the initial fall. When you're actually out there and you're pitching the jig and you're letting it fall, you're not going to slow it down at all. But on that initial descent. What you want to do is you want to stay as vertical as possible in the water. That's goal number one. You want this jig to get down as fast as possible. So it's kind of counterintuitive, but by applying a little bit of pressure on the spool, either with your thumb or your index finger here, it'll keep the jig in a vertical position in the water. So rather than kind of wildly fluttering down, it'll shoot straight down like that. It'll get down to your strike zone faster, and you'll be fishing faster, and it'll allow you to um, keep in that vertical position, which I'm going to keep harping on vertical, vertical, vertical. Um, for a lot of things until we switch over to uh, the micro stuff. Okay. Um, so by controlling that descent, you know when you're, you're keeping your jig shooting down at the bottom, you get down, you're straight up and down, now you start pitching. So let's talk about the features of the, the, uh, the reel and what's important. So first things first, this is an Ocean Jigger 2000. They make three models, comes in a 1500 gear, uh, and it comes in a 4000 as well. So this thing's a beast. All right, this is what I use in very deep water or if I'm fishing for very, very big stuff. So, like, for instance, I was in Panama last year. I brought these, and these were pretty much all I used because you never down there. Um, but narrow spool is good because it, it, it eliminates you really the need for level winding a lot when you're pitching because you don't want to have to constantly be thinking about, is my line you know, lying evenly on the spool? Um, having that narrow spool kind of keeps it pretty much level winds itself for the most part. Um, this one will hold about 500 yards of 30 pound power probe, which is what I use. Uh, most applications that you're going to use out here, you're going to use probably 30 pound, unless you get out real deep, 20 pound uh, in the deeper, deeper water. Uh, we'll talk about the, the line in a little bit after we talk about the, the reel some more. So other features of this uh, reel, which are really cool, is the auto engage feature. So if you see I've opened it up, 
when you hit that 12 o'clock position, it automatically engages. What I like about that is I don't have to take my hands off of the reel at any time. Or if, I'm, if I get hit on the drop, the initial drop happens a lot. Um, boom, you're, you're already in there and you're engaged. So very beneficial. Star drag. Star drag versus lever drag is really your own preference. Um, I've been having a lot of success with these. I've landed more big stuff on these than I have on anything else that I've fished. Um, but you really want to have a smooth drag, okay? Whatever reel you decide to go through, if you go for it, smooth drag is really key because, again, you're going to be fighting off the reel, not off of the rod. So if you have any kind of jerky action on there with that lighter line, you might run into some issues. So you want to make sure that you have smooth drag. This one puts out about 23 pounds of drag, which is more than sufficient uh, usually. Um, a lot of folks don't really realize how much 23 pounds is. Well, I need 30, I need 40. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you do. Um, for, for most applications, I'm going to have my strike drag set at about 12 to 15 pounds. And that's really for just about everything from big river to snapper. Um, I'd rather have my drag set a little bit too tight to start than to have it set too loose. It's a lot easier to back off the drag than it is to put more drag on there. So I usually run it a little bit tighter than usual. Um, you know, most folks talk about that. You want to have a 25 to 30 percent of the of the breaking strength will line. Um, I don't think you really necessarily need that, but um, we'll talk about the line a little more extensively in a bit. Uh, other features of this: longer arm. Okay, uh, this has a, a, a long adjustable arm. There's two holes here. If you remove this little cap, it goes from 80 to 92 millimeters. I always have mine on the longer setting. I like the longer setting because it gives me more leverage and more torque on fish to crank on them, okay? So I like having that extra length on there. Uh, it, that 92 millimeters, that like 90 to like 100 is kind of the sweet spot that I found for a reel of this size. Once you get a little bit bigger in reels, like this one here, again, this one is also adjustable and this one goes from 98 to 110 millimeters and that's a whole to whole measurement. Uh, the bigger the reel, the bigger the gears in it, the more torque it can withstand. So uh, the longer handles are beneficial. For, uh, for really cranking on the fish. Um, what else do we have on this reel? That's really about it in terms of the, the features of the reel. So I mentioned before, line capacity on this one, uh, 30 pound, you get about 500 yards, 20 pound, you can get uh, about six, give or take. So it's a pretty versatile reel in terms of the where you can use it, how you can use it. Um, you can use this from very shallow water to about, you know, I fish these out to about 800 feet. Of, of water in the bottom. All right, so there's two models. There's a PG power gear, which is a 5.8 one, and then there's a high gear, which is a 6.2. The power gear takes up 38 inches per crank, the high gear takes up 46 inches per crank. It's actually a good question. It raises a little bit of a kind of a theoretical thing, but I think it's, it's beneficial. When I'm fishing for group or big stuff on the bottom, uh, and usually up until about, let's say, 400 feet of water. I'll, I like to use the power gear. Um, I like the power gear because I think that little bit of extra torque helps you get uh, those initial cranks on the fish. And the initial cranks on the fish, particularly bottom dwellers, is, I think, critical in, in, in getting them off the bottom and, and to the boat. Uh, when you're in a little bit deeper water, that four to 400 to, let's say, 600, 650, I don't know if you guys are going to be going that far, but um, we'll just talk about that. <laughs> so... Um, if you're in that four, four to six fifty range, uh, I would throw a twenty pound on there, and I'll use the high gear. So, with reels, there's a couple things. So, first thing is your effective drag when you're at the surface versus when you're actually fishing. Okay, so as the, as you go down in the spool, the further you go down in the spool, the more effective drag you put out. So you can have you know fifteen pounds of stri strike on the surface with a full spool, but when you're down to half the spool and 400, 500 feet of water. Now that drag is effectively increased to 20 pounds of drag because the smaller the lower, the lower you go down on here the higher the drag winds up being because of the smaller diameter of the uh of really the line that's still on there so keep that in mind if you are fishing deeper if i fish very deep you know six seven eight nine hundred feet of water uh, i usually have my drag set a little bit lighter than i normally would set it because once you're down at that depth uh you're you know, you're going to have a higher strike, a higher drag setting, which could affect, you know, the line if you do actually hook up. Um, these are also come in power gear and uh, and the high gear, just like these all models come, come like that. Um, this one is a little bit different.
pounds in terms of just how. Okay, this one puts out about 40 pounds of drag. So like I said, the fish is big stuff. When I down pound them off, they do comparisons and things like that. This is just puts the brakes on everything. They're actually using this for blue pin tuning. Now, which is great. There's a couple guys out of, uh, out of North Carolina that lend uh, six, seven hundred pounders on, on that reel, which is really just impressive. I mean, in terms of the piece of machinery, it's just yeah, it's impressive. And I fished a lot of stuff, and company man aside, these are the best reels. Um, all right, so let's talk about the line. So braided line is key. All right, you'll see that I have a top shot on here. Um, usually my top shot is about 15 feet of fluoro. Um, I will use anywhere from 40 to 60 pound fluoro depending on the application. Most of the time it's in that 50 to 60 pound range. Okay, but micro guides, right? So how do we get a line to line connection that is slim enough to pass through these guides? So, there's two connections that I recommend. Uh, there is a FG knot, which you guys probably heard about, which is the hand tied kind of Chinese bear belt deal, uh, or a PR knot. And that's what I use. A PR knot is, has to be tied with a bobbin, okay? It stands for peach ranking if anybody is uh, keeping score at home. But uh, you can see that this, this is my connection here. So my line of line, if I put it against my shirt, you can see it's about as slim as you possibly can get. And uh, by tying this knot, you get a 100% connection line to line. So you don't lose any strength of your braid or any strength of your floor up. And this thing, I have never had one of these fit. So if you tie this correctly, you're getting the absolute best line to line connection that you can have. The braid, the braid is important because you want to have no stretch. Because uh, if you have stretch in here, then your jig is really just not going to be doing anything. The stretch of the line is going to, and the weight of the jig. The jigs kind of maybe you'll do this a little bit, but you're not really going to get the benefits of uh, really being able to work that jig without having braided line. So, have anybody heard of uh, the PE scale of line? Anybody? All right. So, it's three ways that you can measure pound test for braid, or sorry, really measure braid. There's uh, there's the American way, which is pound test. So, I said 30 pound test or 20 pound test, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that power pros. 30 pound is going to be the same as, you know, socks, right? It's just, um, that's really in relation to each individual company and everybody kind of does their own thing with that. The other way you can measure it is like the IGFA method, which is the actual breaking strength of the line. So 12 pound line breaks at 12 pounds, um, 50 pound will break at 50 pounds. The other way to measure it and what they do in Asia is called PE. So PE system stands for polyethylene, which is what the line is made of. Um, it, it measures the diameter of your break. And why that's important is because you want to make sure that you have a thin diameter line to cut through the water better. All right. Now, what I like to do, um, and I did this pretty obsessively before, um, you know, when I was kind of figuring this stuff out, is really measure where your braking strength actually is on that line. So, um, what I found is that 30 pound power pro, it actually breaks somewhere around 42 pounds. So 42 pounds, a lot of folks, you know, they ask, how can you catch a big fish on 30 pound line, 20 pound line? Well, if my reel only puts out 23 pounds of drag on the best day, and I'm using 30 pound line that breaks at 40 pounds, I can have this thing absolutely locked and still not have an issue with break. Now, the other, the other thing that comes up a lot of times is, well, what about that sudden stop? You know, you got that fish on the boat, it stops. Well, that's where the parabolic rod comes in. Okay, so that parabolic rod will act as a shock absorber for a little bit and it'll, it'll kind of alleviate the pressure that's on that break. So you can still use a very thin diameter line um, and stay much more vertical in the water uh, without sacrificing your breaking strength of the line. You know, a lot of folks, particularly around like Panhandle, uh, it's not so much over here as bad anymore as it was, but a lot of folks are setting their ways, you know, we need 80 pound braid and a hundred pound monitor to get them out of the structure. Look, if, your line is in the structure, if your braid's in the structure, you've already lost, okay? Because braid breaks through abrasion. How many times have you had braid break in straight pull where there wasn't maybe like a nick or something in the line? It breaks from abrasion. So if you're in a straight pull and you're trying to force whatever's on there, you can put a lot of heat on that 30 pound braid or that 20 pound braid that you may not have thought that you could put on it before, okay? So why is the diameter so important for us? Well, going back to that theme, keeping vertical in the water, Think of it like this. If I took this, this line 
and I have you know 200 feet of it in the water, and I wove it into like a little square. That's like a look. That's all the water resistance that's affecting that line. You don't really think of it that way because your line's going up and down in the water, but really it's still it's a surface area issue, right? The more surface area that you have, aka the larger diameter that you have in your line, the more water influence is going to be there. So if you have any kind of current at all or a wind drip, your line's not going to be cutting through that water quite as well. So that's why that 30 pound is kind of the best benefit of strength versus thin diameter. So you can kind of not have to worry about the line breaking. Oh, sorry guys. <laughs> A little way. Um, not have to worry about that line breaking, but also still keeping that line vertical in the water. All right. Another thing that a lot of people don't talk about is that by dropping the diameter of your line, you actually can use a lighter jig. So particularly in deeper water, this comes into play. You know, if you're in over two, three hundred feet of water, um, by having a thinner diameter line and cutting through that water better, oftentimes I'll be on a boat. People will wonder why why are you so up and down when my jig is, is kind of all over the place, right? Well, a lot of times I'm using thinner diameter line than they are. Alright. So having that thinner diameter lets you use a lighter jig so you're not beating yourself up using you know something like like this monster. This is a 440 gram jig. Um, you know, I could drop down to maybe a 210 gram jig and get the same action that I want, not have to beat myself up with a heavier jig um, just by using that lighter diameter. So we we're touching before about the, why it's a conventional reel and why that's important. I mentioned about the pressure on the spool, the percent of the jig, contact with the bottom, and also using it as a winch on the way up. Why don't we use spinning gear? Well, as we mentioned before, these are really one-trick ponies. These are not lift and pump kind of things. How do you gain line on a spinning reel? You have to lift and pump. Right? You have to be able to lift and crank down. Whereas these, I can just point and crank all day long. More importantly, though, you can't control the descent of the jig with spinning gear. Okay, a lot of times people say, "Oh, well, I can pinch the line," and it's not the same, right? By being able to put pressure on the spool with your finger, you can very precisely figure out how you can keep that jig in that vertical position in the water. So, talked about the line, talked about the leader, talked about the rod and the reel, not for the jigs, right? So, a lot of the questions that I get are, uh, "What color is the best?" and what jig should I use for insert species in here? Okay, there is, all right, there is no one best jig for any particular species. All right, there are certain issues with color that I, I'll touch on in a second that I think are very important. But in terms of fish hitting jigs, I've seen little tiny fish hit great big jigs and big fish hit little tiny jigs. They don't care. This is a reaction strike. Okay, the fish are seeing something that looks like it's wounded or dying in the water. And for every other meal that they've ever eaten in their life, it has been a real fish until they get a mouthful of metal. So they don't know. They're just opportunistic predators. And opportunistic predators will go and they will get the easy meal if possible. So by mimicking that wounded or dying fish in the water, it doesn't necessarily matter what the jig is, so long as it's matched the conditions of the day. Okay. So if I have a lot more current, I'll use something that's longer and skinnier. If I'm in something where there's not a lot of current, I'll use something that's shorter and fatter. Shorter and fatter will generally flutter more in the water. Um, longer and skinnier ones, sometimes they'll, oddly enough, flutter just as much as those, but their shape of them will let them get down and stay down better in a higher current situation. Um, this here is a Shimano Shimmerfall. This has been uh, really one of my go-to jigs for probably the past year and a half uh, since they introduced them. I, I really love this jig. It's, um, you know, again, company man aside, I really like these a lot. These are Sea Falcon jigs. This is a S Impact. This one, always in my bag. Um, this one is a Z Slow, and then I have a Shimano Windfall here. Uh, this guy is from Jig Pro. This is a Strike, also an outstanding jig. So, I've got all kinds of colors, right? I've got pink and silver, I've got black jig, I've got white and pink, and this one here, kind of a more natural bait looking, uh, kind of dark to light. You got a question? Oh, we'll get to the hooks in a sec, don't you worry. <laughs> What's your definition of slow current versus fast current? All right, so I live on the east coast of Florida. So when I was starting this out, we're, we deal a lot with the Gulf Stream over there. So if we're in 100 feet of water, which for us, you can basically throw a rock and hit 100 feet of water, 
whereas here you got to make a hell of a run. Um, we're dealing with currents two to four knots over there usually. So that's what I'll consider a higher current situation. Something between one to two knots, uh, that's kind of a medium. Anything under a knot, I mean, good for you. It's, a, it's, it's that's, that's my ideal. That's really why I fish in the Gulf a lot more than I fish on my side of the state. I just feel I really prefer the current that you guys have over here. So, the jigs and the colors of the jigs. So, I haven't really necessarily noticed that there's a, a real big difference in the color that you select. So, so long as two things are there, or one or two things are there. Number one, I really like when a jig reflects UV light. Okay, particularly at depth. Uh, you know, when you're fishing in deeper water where it's basically dark down there, those fish still have eyes, and they're they have to be tuned into something. They're living in pitch black, so UV light does penetrate deeper in the water column than visible light. And you also have to think about how the visible light is going to change as you go down in the water column, because what we see up here isn't what they see down there. The visible light spectrum, the first one that's going to go is going to be your reds. The last ones that are going to go are going to be your, your uh, whites and blues um, when you get to, to the bottom. Uh, kind of just Roy G. Bitt, remember from grade school. Um, so I like a jig that reflects UV light. So something like this, which is orange, which might not even be glowing. If I hit this with a UV flashlight, this thing's going to light up. It's going to just reflect all that UV light. I really like that. I really like when the jig has a, a, a high contrast from dark to light. Kind of mimics the, the, the pattern of a bait fish. This one actually has the scale boost uh, technology on it, which is essentially lifelike uh, scales that are embedded into the jig. And just, I mean, it looks like any kind of bait fish that would be out there. And this comes in a bunch of different colors, six different colors, six different weights. Black jigs. When you're fishing really deep, hell, even if you're fishing fairly shallow, I like darker jigs um, a lot too, because I think it puts a very good silhouette. Uh, in the water. Uh, this one here in particular, this one does reflect UV light. So if you hit this black side with a UV flashlight, it'll glow blue. It'll hit and, and it'll reflect UV light. So I think that's kind of key with your darker jigs. But the deeper that I go, the darker the colors that I like to use a lot of times. Uh, a lot of people want to have like something that's all glow. Okay. But you know, what they're eating doesn't glow necessarily. I mean, sure, there's some bioluminescence uh, for some things in deeper water, but for the most part, it's not like a light party and you know, 500 feet of water on the bottom. These things are just eating with the movement that are down there. So, the gentleman asked about two hooks versus single hooks. Okay, um, I'm going to explain kind of first of all why do we use a hook on the top and the bottom of your jig? So, generally speaking, fish strike from the head first. Okay, so if this jig is swimming in the water in this direction, the fish is going to come from here, get the hooks in its mouth. These will swing around, usually hit them somewhere on the side to get a very secure hook set. Two smaller hooks on the top and bottom give you the most opportunity for a hookup with the fish, whether it's in the mouth or uh, somewhere around the face. I mean, I've had situations, you know, the fish be hit on the top of the head with a, with a hook. Oftentimes, though, you'll have at least one hook in the mouth. But by having two hooks on the top and two hooks on the bottom, it dissipates the weight that any one hook is going to actually they bear the front up. So you're not going to have all of the weight of one fish on a little three-aught hook. These are uh, Gamagatsu 510 hooks. I've been using these for probably seven or eight years. Um, and I like these because, first of all, they come in a package that I, I can make all of my assist hooks myself for the most part, uh, but they also have an outside bar. So what's important there is when this jig is going around in the water, if it does catch your leader, it slides right off. Okay, so you don't have a barb on the inside and I haven't noticed any difference in the hook set of uh, having the barb on the outside or on the inside. Now, when I use heavier jigs, so something like this, these are big hooks, right? Um, you want to make sure that your, your hooks are not really going to influence the jig and how it swims in the water. Okay, So the heavier jig that you use, the heavier hooks that you can use as well. And when I'm in deeper water, I like to use an oversized hook. These are eight outs. Um, sometimes I use a, a six or a seven. But on the real big stuff, I like to have a, a big, strong hook on there. Two reasons. One, single hooks tend to get a very good hook set in the mouth, um, and, and it's really embedded in that jaw. Uh, and this thing is going to be taking the full force of whatever uh, whatever's on the other end of it. Um, other reason, having a bigger hook sometimes keeps the smaller stuff off. So if you're fishing, particularly in very deep water, where you're dealing with like rosies or 
um, like black layer rosefish, things like that, when you're trying to get a golden pile, sometimes those little fish uh, can't get their mouth around that little that hook. So um, that's why we use the two different hooks. Do you have any other questions on that, or that answer pretty much? No, I do not, because I'm not big fishing. <laughs> that's not to say that you can't do that. Um, you know, a lot of folks will put a little, you know, especially if they have a single hook, put a little strip of vanilla, a little strip of squid on there, kind of add some scent to it. Very effective. I'm kind of a purist, so if it's not hitting the jig that's naked, I don't want the fish. So that, that is a moral decision for you. Yeah. Yep. We're gonna we're gonna go ahead and talk about that and how we set these up. So um, I have these. These will show you how we set up our terminal connections. So I mentioned before. Um, sorry. These things are really sticky, which is good. All right, so how do I set up my terminal connection here? There's two ways to really do it. So off your fluoro, you can either tie to a ball bearing swivel, which is a spro ball bearing swivel. It's the number four. Uh, so I think it's like 110 or 130 pound uh, swivel. Uh, or you can tie to a solid rig. So when I'm fishing for uh, Regular slow pitch, not not micro jigs. I personally prefer a ball bearing swivel. Okay, I like the ball bearing swivel because it allows the hooks to spin independently of the uh, of the line, so you're not making any line twists. Because oftentimes, we're on their mouths are open, they kind of spin in the water like this. And yes, braided line, it is braided, it is you know, twisted sort of. But when you really notice that is if you actually have to cast the next time when you're out there. So sometimes you'll cast and people get wind knots and they don't even know how on a conventional reel. And that's why oftentimes they get up. Their, their line is just twisted from, from the fish that they catch. The other way that you can do it is tie to a solid ring. Okay, a lot of people like that way. It's really a personal preference thing. I find that the ball bearing swivel is better. Off of your ball bearing swivel or your solid ring is a split ring. Okay, these are um, these are triple wrap split rings. Uh, they're by Wolverine. I've been using them for years. Uh, and these go to your hooks. So your hooks are kind of independently off of that split ring. Now, these will be your best friend on the water. These are split ring pliers, okay? Uh, split ring pliers allow you to quickly and easily swap out your jig without having to cut and retie, which gets really annoying. So you open up this, the split ring, a couple of turns, now I'm connected. So what you're going to see is there's a direct connection, direct connection on there from my line to my hooks, okay? This jig is swinging completely independently. I can go all the way around like this. It's not going to be able to use be used against me, like by the fish, to wedge out the jig that's in its mouth. It's completely independent of everything. So I like to have that type of a setup. Um, never tie directly to the jig itself. I always like to have that intermediary of that split ring here uh, because it does allow for that free spinning, uh, fluttering of the jig um, and get the, the best action out of it. So. All right, so we're talking about uh, the hooks that are on there. Uh, I mentioned that I do like to use single hooks when I'm fishing for bigger stuff. Uh, so if I'm grouper fishing, I'm gag grouper fishing, which unfortunately nobody can get fishing for a while this year. But uh, even red groupers, uh, I do like to have a single hook on there because I feel like you do get a better hook set in the mouth. Uh, and you know, with with all that can go wrong on, on a small hook, I think that kind of mitigates that risk a little bit. Um, if I mentioned before about that PR knot, I didn't show you this little uh, party favor that I brought. This is a PR bobbin. There's two different types. There's the old school one like this. which is the one that I use just because I've always been using it. Um, then they have others. So this looks like a fly tie knot, right? Kind of same deal. Then there's other ones like this where you can actually you know, tension it with the, the drag on there. And basically what you do is, um, if you've ever seen a video, uh, I would recommend just, if you're a, a drinker, grab a six pack and YouTube and just see what happens one night. Just go and try it. Um, I used an FG knot for years before I used a PR knot. And really, the only reason why I didn't do it is because I was kind of scared of the knot. I was intimidated by it. And I was like, geez, you know, it just looks so complicated, but really it's not that hard. Um, concept is basically um, you have your, your lines together parallel, so braid and fluoro together. You spin, you have a, you, you thread your braid.
braid through here, wrap it around uh, this section, and then also wrap it around the arm to give it a little bit of tension. That's what that drag knob does, it provides that tension. Wind it down, and then flip it, and just how a bimini kind of goes down over the top, that's what you're doing. You're getting these really tight wraps, and, that, and the end product is that super slim line-to-line -line connection that you have on there. So I mentioned that I like the uh, the swivel setup when I when I'm fishing like traditional slow pitch, but for when I actually drop down to micro jigs, so micro jigs, something like this little guy, it's a 35 gram jig. Um, I'll use this in 20. I, I mean, I caught a peacock bass on this actually last week. So um, I'm kind of exploring what we can do with jigs, and I'm. Uh, I'm going to be going on an inshore trip tomorrow to see if I can get a snook to, to bite one of these things. But um, I, I'm having a lot of fun with micro stuff because I've done the slow pitch so much that, you know, after a while, things get, you know, you've done enough. Let me try something new. And the, the micro jigging stuff has been really, really fun, particularly for your coast where you have to make a gigantic run to get into any measurable water. If you want to get out there in that 40, 50 foot area, Drop something down like this, you know, a little, this is a current sniper, this is a 35, they come, uh, this is 60 gram, same jig, all, you know, all have the same profile, same uh, characteristics in the water, but you're going to match that weight of the jig to uh, the conditions of your desk. This here is a little uh, windfall, which is kind of very similar to like the uh, uh, the, the flat ball, or uh, what are they call it? Uh, once they, I don't know what I'm blanking on it, the ones they use for tuna all the time. It's very similar to that, but it gives that same kind of wildly action in the water. For the smaller jigs, though, I like to use just one single hook because I feel like the fish are actually going for the entire thing as opposed to, you know, coming from one side versus the other. And I find that a little 5 uh Gamagatsu live bait hook is kind of the best uh, weight to strength ratio because these things, you're not going to bend this thing. You can have whatever you want on, on this type of a, a hook, even though it's pretty small, but it's not going to really affect the action of the jig because it's like just a smaller, lightweight hook that's on there. So, well, let's just for that. Uh, for the micro jigging stuff, I mentioned before uh, many times about vertical, 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 vertical. It's not necessarily as important with the micro stuff. Um, so, the micro stuff, you actually can get away with spinning gear. I'm going to be experimenting with some spinning gear stuff uh, coming up pretty, pretty soon, but I like to use the Ocean 1500. It's a nice, small, light setup. If anybody wants to come up at the end, just feel how light these things really are. When you're looking at less than two pounds, you know, for an overall setup that's going to be able to land a 40, 50 pound fish, no, no problem. Um, these are a little bit shorter. These are a 6'3", so opposed to a 6'6", six, six or a 6'8". This is 6'3", and you can see, see that tip is very light on these things. So these are really designed to get the good action on much lighter jigs. You can be a little bit more off access, you know, you can pitch out, kind of work the jig back to you, kind of walk the dog at you, or if you're straight up and down in 40, 50 feet of water, you know, I, I've told a couple of folks here before, I call it action fishing. You know, it, it's just, you get so many bites, and even if they're small fish, it's just so fun, especially if on, you're on light tackle, so if you just want to get out for a little bit, don't want to make a big run offshore, these light jigs, these micro jigs are definitely uh, the way to go. So. We talked about the jigs, we talked about the rods, the reels, the line. Uh, how do you fight a fish? Right? So, I mentioned before having that jig under your forearm, or having the rod under your forearm. By having the rod under your forearm, you're using this as kind of like a lever. This is your fulcrum. <laughs> so, you're using the weight of the jig to do most of the work, and the recoil of the rod is really going to do it all for you. So, as opposed to speed jig, where you're just ripping the thing through the water. A very slow, even unload, very easy process, right? Now, the fun part is when that jig disappears. Okay, so when you're pitching that jig in the water, and all of a sudden, huh, it's not bad in your arm. Okay, you go from here underneath your arm. I mentioned before that the butt, uh, the butt into the rod, how it's just kind of jamming your arm in there. You want to keep that rod parallel to the horizon. Okay, and you'll be able to put a lot of pressure on that fish and kind of just point and crank, point and crank. A lot of folks ask, what do you do if there's sharks? How are you going to force them up if there's sharks? I got news for you. You're not going to be the shark. They will outswim anything that you want to do. And if you've ever done the math on it in terms of like how fast you can actually crank on something like that, let's say you're you know, uh, a 15-year-old boy at the peak of your forearm strength, and you can 
you get two cranks per second on this thing, right? Even with two cranks per second on it, you're only moving that jig about eight miles per hour in water. And that's completely, you know, not, no fish on there at all. So if you have tension on that thing, it starts going to get, you know, it just is. So cost of doing business, it, it, you know, you're not forcing it up with, I don't care what you have. You can have an electric on there and hammer that thing down. You're not being a shark if you want to get the fish. Um, so you're up, you're fighting the fish. You're reeling up, you get the fish up to the top of the water. One of the things that I see in the most in terms of these things breaking breaks the tip section right here. And the reason why it does that, one of two things, either one, they got tip wrapped because they weren't paying attention, happens. Or the fish actually is coming overboard and you haven't put the reel in free spool and control the, control the line with your thumb. By having that tension on the line, having that line locked on here, if someone gaffs that fish and brings it over the gunnel and it comes on deck, oftentimes that's going to put a hell of a lot of pressure on here. It's going to cause that tip to snap. So once you get that fish up and it's kind of floating on the water, hopefully floating on the water, um, as soon as that gaff gets in the fish, I'm always off the drag. Always off the drag. Okay? Once it gets on the boat, I'll deal with that later, but always off the drag. Um, in terms of pitching, I'm always counting my handle turns. Okay, so I know the gentleman here asked about inches per crank, right? So I'm always looking at my electronics and I'm looking at where those fish are in the water column. All right, if, if the fish are at the very bottom and I see that they're, you know, eight to ten feet off the bottom, and I know that one handle turn is about three feet, I can just count my handle turns and boom, I'm right in front of the fish's face. That's where I start pitching. So I hit the bottom, fish are 12 feet up, one, two, three, I start pitching. Now I'm in the fish's face. You can move your handle turns, you know, little tiny turns like this. You can make one full turn, but this is really what pitches. Pitches one full turn of the handle. All right, and you always counting those handle turns, always keeping in mind three feet per crank, roughly, um, and you can know exactly where your jig is in the water, so you can really target these fish. It's almost like sight fishing with electronics, really. Uh, if you think of it that way, you're looking at where they are on the sounder and just trying to get it in front of their face. And oftentimes, when you when you get that timing right. You know, it's just game on for whatever's down there. Um, what else about fighting the fish? Try not to be too jerky. Try try to resist that urge uh, of, of lifting and pumping. It's one of the hardest habits to break because ever since you were a little kid, it's always lift up, wind down, lift up, wind down. Which brings me to my next point. When you're actually pitching this jig in the water, you want to reel on the way up, not on the way down. Okay? Counter, it, it's hard to do at first, it's very hard to break that muscle memory of doing it. But if you, oftentimes what I'll see, um, you know, folks when they're starting out, first of all, they won't have it under their, their arm, they'll have it under here. Okay, that's fine, you can still kind of do this. But you're not gonna get your full range of motion. So here I'm gonna do this, whereas here, I do this, right? So you have a much bigger range of motion. Um, secondly, when, uh, when I see people um, that are just starting out, you know, a lot of times they're thinking of this, you know, straight up and down, and they want to they, 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 you know, they do jerky motions like this, and the jig will kind of flip or it'll get, uh, a lot of times you'll see this will be a common thing when folks are first starting, is uh, their hooks will get tail wrapped on the, on the, the bottom hooks will get wrapped around the leader and your jig will foul up. Not a big deal if you're in a hundred feet of water, it is a big deal if you're using a 400 gram jig and eat hundred feet of water. All right, the reason why that uh, usually becomes a problem is because you're going too fast. Slow pitch jig, slow down, okay, slow down. Very slow, even unloads. But you don't want to reel on the way down because that's going to take the slack out of the line that you're trying to create. If you take the slack out of the line, then the jig's not going to do what the jig's supposed to do in the water. So you're just hurting yourself. All that jig is doing is going up and down like this. Maybe you'll get a bite, but it's not going to be nearly as effective. We have five minutes? All right. So five minutes, I'll open it up to questions. Uh, if anybody has any, if anybody doesn't have them now or doesn't want to say them, we'll come up later, whatever, that's all good. Uh, or you can reach me on social media, uh, Instagram, Mr. Benny Ortiz. We'll start from the gentleman. Now, are you always fishing this as you're drifting or if you're on a headphone and you're anchored up, you fish it out and they work it back to you? All right. So two, two questions, if anybody couldn't hear, was, uh, so are you fishing it from a drift? Or if you're fishing on an anchor, how do you kind of work the jig uh, dealing with, with the current that's out there? I prefer to fish from a drift. I think you cover more ground that way. I like it a lot better. Uh, if you are fishing on an anchor, 
what I find is that usually the biggest fish that you're going to get is going to be the first drop or two at that spot. Usually the first drop. If there's a, a big, if there's a big dominant fish that's there and they see that easy meal, the first thing that's down there, you're going to get hammered. So like the biggest you know mutton I ever fought in you know 80 feet of water in the tour tube is was on an anchor boom, uh, and it was the first drop that just bang, just came on. Now, I don't like the anchors because, you know, it's not like you're getting them to a frenzy with a, a chunk of slick or things like that, and you're not covering any ground. So I like to I like to drift. So when I drift, I always pitch up current. So whatever way the boat is going, take, uh, take a minute or two before you make that drop, see how fast your drift is going to be. That'll kind of help you figure out which jig is probably a better choice for, for your first drop. But I like to pitch up current. That way, as the boat's moving this way, I pitch over here. And as it moves, bang, I'm vertical, 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 vertical. Once I get scoped out to about like a 45 degree angle or so, I'll reel up and reset. And that can really be determined on how fast that I drift is. Um, gentlemen, okay, one second. Uh, so if I am on the boat and I have to retie one, I will. I. It's one of the reasons why I have 17. So <laughs> I, I go out with multiple reels. So rather than, uh, you know, go ahead and try to retie the PR knot on a moving boat, which you can do. It's not the easiest thing, but you can do it. I'll just grab the reel and put it on. Uh, like two and a half minutes. Yeah, roughly. Yeah, push. The, so the rod is really designed just for the weight of the jig. Okay, so if you have a, a heavier jig, like, a, like this was a 400 gram jig, I want to match that with a rod that has a max rating of like 500 grits. So that way I keep within that that rating. Anybody else? Okay. okay, so the general rule of thumb is one gram per foot uh, of, of water. Over here, that really holds because you guys don't have a lot of current. On the east coast where I live, it's usually like a gram and a half per foot, give or take. Now that really holds only up to about, let's say, five, 600 feet of water. Um, I don't know what it is once you hit that point, but once you're at four or 500 gram jig, that's really what you're going to be maxed out at, up until like a thousand feet of water when you're out. You're talking about life jigging for a snook and short. Yeah. How are you going to approach that? What's that? How are you going to approach that? Like short. Yeah. Sorry about the, the wind. How am I going to approach uh, yeah. snook fishing in short? You haven't done it. Yeah. How would you start? How would I start? The first thing I'm going to start with is get a guy who knows how to snook fish. <laughs> and I'm going to go on his boat, and he's going to go, we got some snook here. And I go, all right, let me see what I can do. And it's, I'm, really, I'm just waiting at this point. You know, this is pure, I'm purely uh, experimental, trying to learn, see what's going on. I mean, I'm sure I could go out there and throw lives if my baits had it or, or whatever, um, you know, on each more stuff. But yeah, this is kind of new territory, I think, for pretty much everybody. So I don't think anyone's caught a snook on a slow fish jig yet. So we're going to try that tomorrow. <laughs> See what happens. Any other questions? If not, uh, feel free to come up at the end. I'm going to kick off the stage here soon. Thank you so much for coming. I hope it was informative. Uh, if anything else, feel free to come up.